Hello guys, and welcome to Supreme Ruler Ultimate. I ran a poll over on the community section of the YouTube channel, asking what you guys thought would make the best third guide for Supreme Ruler Ultimate, and you guys have spoken. You guys picked game settings and what they mean, or how to set up a sandbox game. Now, here's the thing about the settings, is it's roughly the same across all the modes of the game. To clarify, the modes are generally campaign, Sandbox, Scenario, and Multiplayer. Sandbox is the actual original way to play the game with all the settings unlocked. Scenario is just like a scaled down version, but it still has all the settings. Multiplayer, again, is the same. It's just campaign that's different. Campaigns have limited settings, and some of the settings are just predetermined. In fact, the campaign events are in the sandbox, so the only reason that you would ever play the campaign is because you wanted to get achievements on Steam or whatever. So let's go look at these settings, and I'm gonna go over each and every one of them and what they mean with you guys. So once you go to start your game, assuming you're starting a sandbox scenario, multiplayer, yada yada, you're gonna go and you're gonna first pick what sandbox do you want to play. Let's just pick... 1936 the road to war under that we can see the map we can see the amount of regions in the map and we can open up different regions and find a country that we would like to play within it if you sometimes see the image disappear or the text disappear that's just a bug with the game and that happens in other parts of the game too under that we have two buttons we'll start with the one that actually has words attached this is World Volatility. World Volatility is the AI's willingness to form alliances with other countries and also to declare war. So if you have it on none, then the AI will not declare any wars and they will not make any alliances whatsoever. Low is the lowest setting of aggression and diplomatic activity that allows the AI to declare wars and to form alliances. Now, there was a difficulty change a long time ago in this game's setting, and this low setting used to be medium. There was a lower setting, and they got rid of that because there was complaints that the AI wasn't warlike enough on any of the settings. So there's medium, high, and very high, which all just pump the amount of alliances and wars up drastically. You'll get varying mileage depending on what sandbox or scenario you choose in terms of how aggressive the AI is going to be, but generally I recommend playing on low for a more realistic experience. In sandboxes such as 1936 The Road to War and 2020 World, the AI is still a little extra aggressive despite you being on low, whereas in some of them, such as 1914 Brinksmanship, the AI is surprisingly passive. Moving along, we have victory conditions. Now this is just saying, what do I want to do in order to make the hey you won screen pop up? More than likely, you won't even play a game to see a victory condition, but we'll go over these and you can figure out which one is best for you. Complete just means that, well, you've done everything. You've basically taken over the entire world. That's what complete is. You take over the whole world. Capital means that you take over an opposing nation's capital. This is the main victory condition used in the campaigns. Capture is to capture specific objectives. Unification is probably the most interesting one because what it does is essentially it takes the world population and it asks them to vote on who they want, which country, to rule the world if only one country can do it. And you have a time limit of something like, I don't know, 40 years, 20 years, I think you can set the time limit. And then they take a vote at that time and the game ends and whoever had the most votes wins. The game keeps track of scores. I don't really know the formula. It seems pretty arbitrary and not smart at all, but there's a bunch of different score victory conditions here. Total score, combined, diplomatic score, economic score, technology score, and score of approval rating. And finally, military score as well. You can pick any of these if you would like to have your victory based on your score in any or all of the scored categories. Sphere is a victory condition that was created for Supreme Ruler Cold War and brought into this game. Essentially, it 
changes how the spheres work a little bit, actually, and it makes them more important. It also enables alerts for every time someone changes leanings in a sphere. And the way to win this is to make it so that the opposing sphere that you are on has zero members in it and that usually requires killing the sphere leader but you can technically make the sphere leader move out of his own sphere i have seen it done there's the tech race victory condition which has to do with the tech races such as in the cold war the space race so whoever wins the tech race wins the game then and then there's victory points which is determined by a load of factors just saying however many victory points that you collect in the game that's the winner at the end of a certain period of time or at a threshold. You'll also find this little political leaning button here. You can pick what political leaning that you prefer your cabinet ministers to be. This has varying importance. If you micromanage every part of your government and military and everything, then this doesn't matter. But if you leave anything automated at all by AI, be it trade, resources, producing or managing military units or budgets or taxes or spending in any way, then they are going to operate based on generally what you pick here. So for example, let's say you don't manage your taxes and spending at all. Then you'd pick someone moderate if you just want something in the middle, you don't really have a preference or you prefer moderate economic policies. You can't really easily describe moderate economic policies, so I'll describe the opposing ones, and you'll get an idea of what in-between will look like. Generally, if you want taxes to be lower so that your population is happier, but social spending to be lower and its effects not as well maintained, and you want your cash out to be from things like sales taxes, taxing your, on average, higher priced goods on the market that you're selling to your population, as opposed to getting everything from taxation and making everyone unhappy, then you'd pick conservative. Liberal is if you would have your taxes very high, but taking that money and putting it all into things like social spending to get the higher effects from social spending and your market prices for your population to be lower because you don't need it to be as high because you have the taxes higher, that would be liberal economic policies. Before anybody asks, in terms of this game, none of these are better than the others. Speaking of the extremes, a 100% tax policy and a 0% tax policy can both work very well and be far more successful than any moderate policies, but I'd say moderate is a good choice if you're learning the game and you don't know what you want your AI to do yet. It'll give you a mix, generally, of cabinet ministers as well as some actually in the middle. Now into the meatier part of the game settings, we have scenario settings to start with. The first thing is resources. Here you can set, generally, the amount of resources on the map. Honestly, standard is fine. There's more than enough resources on the map even when you have it set to standard. Abundant would just mean nobody would ever need resources ever and would in a way probably hurt some sections of the economy depending on the scenario. Dwindling and depleted would just increase the need for war to take over the resources that others have and in earlier scenarios there's already problems with finished goods let's say. So this would worsen some of those things technically. Initial funds. No new bonds just means that you have no bonds enabled, no ability to take out debt in order to fund things. And I know that that probably sounds very confusing because I know most probably don't know what debt is. Go watch my economics guide. It'll be up in the cards at the top right of the screen if you want to watch that or in the playlists in the description. I talk about the economics of playing in the game and I'll fully explain bonds and debt and how it actually works if you are watching that video. Default is just normal. Bonds enabled, everyone starts out with their normal balanced funds that the developers have set. Low means everyone starts with less money, but bonds are also enabled. High means everyone starts out with more money, bonds are also enabled. None of these changes the amount of debt you start out with that is preset and only actually present in the modern day scenarios. There is a toggle to turn that off, but we're not at that yet. Next we have approval effects. Approval effects are 
Just what is the reaction to the actions you are taking? How does your population or your military feel when you change spending? When you win or lose an election? How does the world react? to the wars that you start and your population, to nukes that you drop, things like that. Medium is normal, by the way, that is default. Although note, the presets are different depending on every scenario. The next one is critical international opinion. This is a modifier, essentially, on approval effects for things like the world market and all the other countries. So this is an extra punishing mode for declaring wars or doing generally bad things. This makes the games less warlike or slower, especially if there's multiple players involved, because there's only so much warring you can do before the world market stops you from trading on it. Third party relations effects is another modifier for approval effects. This only affects other countries, and the way this works is it looks at your diplomatic relations with other countries and then makes their friends like you more and makes their enemies hate you more. Random events is just the prevalence of random events and you can just turn them off completely as well. Random events are like, oh no, there was a fire at the lumber factory or whatever and now you lost a bunch of timber from your stock or oh yay, there was an extra warehouse just found that had a bunch of timber. It looks like we miscounted, so we gained some extra timber. That kind of thing. Electricity sales enables or disables, if you turn it off, the ability to sell electricity, which to explain that a little bit, it's considered unrealistic. The fact that you can overproduce electricity and sell it to anybody that you want in the world. So there's a way to turn it off or leave it on. Since technically electricity in this game cannot be stored, if you overproduce, you have to sell it or it just goes to waste. With electricity sales off, you'd have to manage your total amount of production to maintain some sort of cost efficiency. You'd want to only be making as much as you actually need in a day because there'd be nothing to do with the excess. And if you don't have enough production, that would actually hurt your industry because you wouldn't just be able to buy more from America when you're China and you know just import electricity from over the ocean. Loyalty penalties to supply and line of sight is a very brutal scenario setting. I always turn this off. It's like I've started turning off critical international opinion. It doubles down on already present penalties that you receive to your production and maintenance of supply in a region that is not loyal to you. And more realistically, and I wish that we could single this part out because it's actually very cool, it makes it so that you cannot perfectly see in land that you do not have loyalty in. This actually allows with certain ROE settings for a player to land in someone's country in a non-loyal area and sneak units through to get to certain other locations. It's very realistic, very cool, but personally I never use it just because the loyalty penalties to supply doubled down because they're already present whether this option is on or off. This just makes it worse, makes certain aspects of supply in this game impossible to deal with and supply in this game is already very difficult. Next up, Spheres of Influence System. This is another thing introduced in Supreme Ruler Cold War imported into Supreme Ruler Ultimate. This basically just makes it so that instead of going with the traditional diplomatic system of one by one organizing treaties with other countries, that there are now spheres that will limit or encourage the diplomatic functions of the game based on your sphere leaning and the sphere leanings of others. There are only two spheres, no matter the sandbox era, when you have this on. The names vary, but it's essentially blue versus red. There's also a non-aligned in the middle that, you know, they're your goal to influence towards your side or otherwise good targets to conquer without antagonizing the other sides. And there's a lot of modifiers within that, but that's a good enough explanation for now. You either have this on when it's checked or you uncheck it and now it's off. There's start game without national debt. So you could have debt enabled by not having it on no new bonds and click this button for say the modern day scenario 
and then nobody starts out with any debt but they can take debt out if they would like to in order to fund whatever it is they're trying to do next up we're on to military settings fog of war obviously is line of sight it's when you do not have line of sight treaties with a country or your own units being able to see there be it actual ground units, air units, sea units, or even satellites, then you will not be able to see in these locations where you have no coverage. Enhanced spotting basically takes the spotting values that are shown on the unit specifications and times threes them. Same thing with unit ranges. It takes the distance a unit can fire and basically times threes them. And the reason for this is because one of their developers decided that he was playing the game with these settings amped up and he decided that it was more fun this way so that's why these settings are here and that's why they're enabled by default you can try with or without it's really a preference thing the next one is units eliminated when region falls if you have this checked then whenever a country surrenders all of its remaining units will disappear just they'll vanish they'll be deleted they'll stop existing you leave this off and you will actually be given the remaining units of a country that you have conquered. Allow nuclear weapons, yes or no? I mean, this is really mostly for players. Do you want them to have nuclear weapons or not? Because the AI is too dumb to use nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapon penalties, also for players. How much of a fallout of approval effects, essentially, do you want to come from using nuclear weapons? Be those penalties from your own population or from other countries? Medium is what's considered normal, although not many scenarios start out with that as the default. Diplomatic Merchant Marine affects mainly the trading of military units. If you leave this enabled, then units will actually be just given to the receiving nation right out of your barracks and they'll have to literally sail them home. If you turn it off instead, then the unit will arrive instantaneously to the recipient nation, but missing half of its health. The giving nation will also provide military goods to repair it up to full health. And I would always recommend playing with this setting off, especially in multiplayer. The AI is terrible at moving their merchant marines from their nations that are selling the military units back to the nations that have bought the units. They're absolutely terrible at doing it. So the units just kind of stack up and spill over into the thousands and this causes a lot of lag and this causes a lot of countries to waste money and be paying for more military units than they can afford. I really hate how this is checked by default because this is a terrible setting. And this, this tooltip is very misleading. Traded units move from seller to buyer when selected. They make it sound like when it's enabled it does it, but that's not how it works. If you want the units to move instantly, then you want this disabled, and for the love of god, please disable it. Next is the weather system. The weather system affects combat and movements of units and supplies and stuff like that. It's a neat touch. I definitely have that on. The Battle of the Atlantic is a very specific mechanic where essentially if the UK is at war with Germany, but at peace with Canada and or the United States at the same time, then Germany, let's say, can send U-boats or submarines out into the Atlantic and sink UK supply convoys, thus hurting their supplies and resources as a result. It was meant specifically to go with the World War II scenario. You can try it out and see if you like it. Next is use rail transport. Originally in the game, rails were only used to move supply. Units could not move along rails. They were a very cheap way to move supplies from point A to point B, and you used roads if you wanted to give units a speed buff. After a few years and many suggestions, they implemented the rail transport system where essentially units can load onto rails now and move at a set speed, not as fast as motorized units can move on roads, but faster than infantry units can move anywhere else because they're on a train and they're moving the speed of the train and they can move without using any supplies because it's assumed that the train has all the supply that they need while they're being transported. You can leave this enabled, it's enabled by default now if you like this system, or if you prefer the actual way the game was meant 
to be played originally, you can disable this and leave rails to be just for supply purposes as they originally were. One reason why that's something that some players usually want is because even though they implemented all this cool functionality to rails, they didn't increase the cost of making and maintaining rails. So technically speaking, unless you need to get motorized and mechanized units from point A to B really, really quickly, it is in almost every instance better now to have rails rather than roads. So it can be a little unbalanced, but I like having it selected for sure. Colonies to keep military complexes affects two things. Number one, it affects that if a colony has military complexes in production at the start of a campaign or the start of a sandbox, if this is checked, then they will keep them. If this is unchecked, then the owner of the colony will have control over the hexes where these are. It also affects whether or not if you go to war with a country and then colonize it, if they keep their military complexes after the war is done. If this is checked, they will keep their military complexes after the war is done and be a militarized colony. If this is unchecked, then the new owner of this new colony will be given the military complexes. But either way, even with this off, you as a player at least always have the capability of returning any hex with anything on it to the AI. One of the reasons that this was implemented is because originally the AI actually made their own military complexes in production, even as a colony, and so they would keep making it more and more because since it would all automatically be given back to the owning country, they would not realize that they had made any, and this was a huge problem as you can tell, and this was one of the solutions, as well as additional functionality for the game. Finally, we'll go to the final part of the game settings here. You have the scheduled game end. You can determine how long do you want the game to go before it ends. This works really well with unification types victory conditions. There are difficulty settings for military, economics, and diplomatic difficulties. These are, for the most part, modifiers. They only really affect the player and how the AI reacts to the player and what stat bonuses or debuffs the AI gets against the player. I usually leave these on normal. Then there's allied victories, which mean if you are allied with every other country remaining on the map, you win. It's just another way to win the game. It's an additional victory condition that's put in the game settings instead of the victory conditions. Then we have fixed capitals. This means that you cannot move your capital at will. So this is especially useful when fighting players because when you lose your capital, you lose a lot of stuff. You lose resources, you lose money, and you lose a fuck ton of military approval, which is very important for your troops to keep fighting. If you have this on, then the capitals are stuck where they're stuck, unless you take the capital, and then I believe it will just move the capital automatically, which it will do whether or not this is checked. If you uncheck it though, a player can move their capital for free with no debuff or penalty whenever they want, including when you are one tile away from their capital about to take it, they could just move it to the other side of the world like haha fuck you bro. The global AI stance is a modifier for how the AI will act. Default is just, you know, normal, this is the way these were intended to function. Passive means they're not really going to do anything, they're not really going to attack much, they're not really going to build up much, they're just kind of going to sit there and enjoy their lives. There's defensive, which will make the AI build up and posture defensively, build defensive units and prepare to be invaded as opposed to preparing to invade. Aggressive is the AI are more likely to invade other countries, they're more likely to build offensive units, and unpredictable means they are randomly going to get assigned to one of these four settings per country. Just every country is going to flip a coin and randomly be assigned to one of these. Start game without units. This means every country, no matter how big and powerful, is going to start with zero units and you get to build up your military from the very start if that is what you would prefer. Limit domestic and military approval effects. This is another way to limit rapid changes in your domestic and military approval ratings if you find that portion of the game to be too difficult. And finally, the road rail removal tool, something else that really should be on. 
this was another feature that was patched into the game. It's not on by default in any scenario, but it really, really should be. This allows you the ability to delete a road or rail on the map that was already placed, be it at the start of the scenario, via an event, or by a player. There's literally no reason to have that off whatsoever unless you're trying to limit other players in some way. And that's it. That's every single setting when it comes to starting a game explained. If you'd like to see more guides about Supreme Ruler Ultimate, then please leave me your ideas in the comments below for what you would like to see me explain, teach, talk about. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a super thanks under the video. It's essentially a tip that you can give a creator for making a video. It's a new YouTube feature. Your comment gets highlighted, and it's a good way to support your creators that are making videos that you enjoy. Otherwise, if you would like to support me and what I am doing, please check the description for links to the YouTube channel membership my Patreon, or my Gilded community server, where you can actually just come hang out if you want and talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, live, which also has a built-in Patreon-like system. Benefits you will receive include weekly shout-outs where I put your name on the screen and acknowledge you for being so awesome and keeping this channel going. Speaking of, I'm gonna end this video with the weekly shout-out for our current supporters, whom you can join for only two bucks a month. But for now, I hope this video was helpful to you Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.